Hello, nos waith tha. Here's hoping that you're all well. Uh, very, very grateful for all you folks on YouTube for all your wonderful comments. Uh, and thank you for the very warm welcome back uh, I received uh, this last week. It's good to know there's folks out there waiting for me to post videos. Uh, I promise I will uh, be answering the questions that you've been posting in the comments. This session, uh, I'm going to be filling out the poem Pray the Anoven. Pray the Anoven, or the Spoils of Anoven, is a poem that some of my regular students are probably a bit sick of. Uh, but hopefully I'll be adding some additional material in this talk. I have made a video on Pray the Anoven a few years back now, uh, and I'm forever referring to it on the Taliesin course and on the Four Branches course. It's just one of those very useful uh, poems uh, in the, the body of Welsh law because it contains so much rich information. It's easy to plug it into the broader network. So it's always useful as a, as a comparison piece. For those of you who aren't sure what Pray the Anoven is, uh, it's a poem from the Book of Taliesin. Um, it was probably composed uh, in the late 12th century, perhaps in the early 13th century, perhaps by uh, a very high-ranking court poet by the name of Prydydd the Moch or Llewarch ap Llewelyn. At least that's the theory put forward by Margaret Haycock in her edition of the legendary poems from the Book of Taliesin, which is the version I'll be referring to in this session. Margaret Haycock reaches that conclusion because there are many similarities between the poem Pray the Anoven and the formal court poetry of Prydydd the Moch. There are similar word combinations, for example. Um, uh, and there's also a, a clear thematic connection between the role of the court bard and the legendary Taliesin, the, the embodiment of the Welsh bardic tradition. It's no surprise that there would be some connection, uh, at least tenuous, between these uh, two figures historical and legendary. Now, Pray the Anoven has been commented on several times by various authors over the years. Last week, we looked at the dialogue or the discourse of Arthur and the Eagle, and we saw how Arthur, in many ways, even though he uh, is a dumb or ignorant character uh, on the surface of it, uh, in that poem, he is actually someone who is engaging with the other world, and in many ways he's engaging with the other world through an animal. But there's certainly a connection here between Arthur and the other world and death, and that's essentially the theme I'm going to be following through here with this poem and next week with the poem uh, Pa Urir Parthor, who is the gatekeeper, that very fascinating poem from the Black Book of Camarthen. But regardless, the poem does many things. Pray the Anoven um, is a very baffling poem, and I think that people are often baffled by it because people are usually looking for one thing in Pray the Anoven. They're either looking for uh, something to tell them about Arthurian law or about Taliesin law or to inform their understanding of a certain aspect, a very narrow aspect of Welsh mythology. But in truth, as with many poems from the Book of Taliesin, Pray the Anoven is actually um, a very diverse poem. There's lots of different strands in there brought together. It's actually part of its appeal. Um, it's a very fast moving poem. It makes these very sharp turns. You move from one type of genre to another. You move from one type of content to another type of content and so on and so on. It's sort of lead you through this kind of kaleidoscopic array of knowledge that the legendary Taliesin uh, is declaiming. The poem is, of course, almost certainly composed in the voice of Taliesin, the legendary Taliesin. So we can imagine that it would have been performed in a court by a court bard or perhaps by one of his apprentices. And whoever the performer was would have taken on the, the dramatic or theatrical role of the Taliesin, perhaps even um, claiming to channel or to be possessed by the spirit of Taliesin. We're not sure, but there are hints of that in the tradition. 
I don't want to bore people who've looked at this poem loads of times with me. So I'm just going to very quickly summarize what we normally go through on the courses. This very first section, of course, its main feature is the exalted prisoner. Uh, the poem begins uh, in very typical fashion, praising the Christian God. I praise the Lord, the ruler of the kingly realm, who has extended his sway over the extent of the world. Maintained was Gwair's prison in Caer Sidi. Caer Sidi being one of the many names for the other world, for Anovn in the poem. Gwair is clearly a prisoner in Caer Sidi, in Anovn. And he appears to be one very special type of character in Welsh mythology. Other similar characters we can think of are, of course, Prideri in the third branch of the Mabinogi, who becomes another prisoner in an enchanted fortress, or Mabon, who is a prisoner, an exalted prisoner, we could say, in a fortress in the story of Kiluch and Dalwen. So there is a character type here. There's a type of story being alluded to in these uh, very first few lines. Maintained was Gwyr's prison in Carcidi throughout Poil and Prideri's story. Many of the sections are going to be ambiguous. We're not going to have a chance to look at all of them in detail. No one went there into Carcidi to be chained into the heavy grey chain guarding the loyal lad. So no one went into the heavy grey chain that binds Gwair in Carcidi before he did. So he's the first to go there. And we can see that he is before the spoils or the herds of Anovan singing sadly. This, of course, is the line that gives us the title to the poem. Pray there Anovan literally means either the spoils, the treasures, or the herds, as in the valuable herds of magical animals of Anovan. Before the spoils or the herds of Anovan, he was singing sadly. Now, Gwair, he could actually be present uh, before the treasures, as in the gold and gems and magical items of Anoven, or he could be some type of shepherd in Anoven, overseeing the magical flocks. Herds, swine herds, shepherds of different kinds are also a feature of Celtic myth and European literature, so this also might be part of what's been referred to here. And until doom shall our poetic prayer continue. Of course, this is Taliesin essentially saying that Gwair is singing sadly because he's chained in Anoven, he's bound and trapped in Anoven. And his sad song is the poetic prayer of the Welsh Bardic tradition. And that that poetic prayer, that sad song, will continually will continue until the end of days, until doom, until judgment day. So we're already seeing here how Taliesin, in a very ambiguous way, in a very unclear way, is referring to native Welsh mythology and conflating it with Christian mythology and Christian story. The poem is full of these types of, of conflations between native Welsh myth and Christianity. Now, this last couplet here is referring to the story of the poem. Three full loads of Prydwen, we went into it, into Anovn, into Caer Sidi. Save seven, none came back from Caer Sidi. Prydwen is, of course, King Arthur's ship. The story being that three full loads of Prydwen, of King Arthur's ship, went into Caer Sidi, perhaps to try and rescue Gwair, or to try and steal the treasures of Anoven, but only seven came back. And here, of course, we see uh, the first allusion to the basic myth contained in the poem. A king who has travelled across the sea uh, to a distant island and there's a big battle and Taliesin is sometimes accompanying this king across the sea and there is a cauldron in the mix. That's the basic story that's being alluded to here. And it's a story that's uh, used in the second branch of the Mabinogi and also in uh, an episode from Kiluch and Dalwen. The similarity between all three of these texts 
suggests that there's an older myth that sits behind all three of, of these texts, that sits behind Prather Anovn. And before the spoils or the herds of Anovn, he was singing sadly, and until doom shall our poetic prayer continue. Three full loads of Prudwen we went into it, save seven none came back from Cairo City. We're working with a 12th or 13th century poem that's referring to a much older type of story, as well as referring to very traditional characters, such as these exalted prisoners like Gwair, but also referring to the Welsh Bardic tradition in connection to those stories and those characters. Gwair singing this poetic prayer, which will continue until the end of times. Taliesin being one of uh, Arthur's companions as he travels to the other world and one of the seven as he returns, yeah? That's where I usually end up when I'm discussing this poem, but there is, of course, much, much more to be said. There are many other sections uh, to cover. The section after this refers to a very interesting cauldron. I'm splendid of fame, song was heard in the four quarters of the fort, revolving to face the four directions. Now, we're not clear if this is referring to Anoven, to Caer Sidi, to the enchanted fortress that Arthur and Taliesin and the three full loads of Pradwen of Arthur's ship are uh, attacking or invading or attempting to gain entry to, or whether this is Taliesin referring to the space he's performing in. I'm splendid of fame, song was heard in the four quarters of the fort. Is this the, the fortress of the performance or the fortress in the poem? The fortress in the story, if you like. We're not sure. It's ambiguous. It's neither clear whether this is the song that's revolving to face the four directions or whether it's the fort. Now, if it's the fort, that would be very interesting because that would suggest that this is a fort with four quarters, four corners, revolving to face the four directions. It's very ambiguous. In later pieces of poetry um, connected with the legendary, legendary Taliesin, we have this idea of Caer Sidi as a revolving space or a spiralling space or a space where different elements spin around. It's not very clear what it means. What we can say is that this is the legendary Taliesin performing in this space. My first utterance was spoken concerning the cauldron kindled by the breath of nine maidens. Now, my first utterance, this could be referring to the tale of Taliesin, the folk tale of Taliesin, where Taliesin, the infant, is found by Elphin on the seashore, and his first utterance, the first bit of poetry he declaims as a magical infant, is concerning the cauldron kindled by the breath of nine maidens. Who these nine maidens are, we're not sure. This could be referring perhaps to the classical nine muses. That's one idea that's very often uh, brought up when discussing this line. Or perhaps it's referring to some uh, order of priestesses that were associated with the cauldron. Strangely enough, Kerry Dwen isn't mentioned at all in this poem. The only uh, spiritually potent women associated with the cauldron are these nine maidens. The fact that Kerry Dwen isn't mentioned in this poem could suggest that this is actually from a very different lineage, a different body of law that gives us the tale of Taliesin. Now, oral traditions are diverse by their very nature. There are different lineages. Similar stories are told in different lineages, but sometimes different lineages make very different uses of the same characters and the same uh, magical object. So Taliesin and the cauldron could be part of this lineage, but Keridwen isn't, whereas she is part of the lineage that gives us the tale of Taliesin, yeah? The folk tale that we all know and love, recorded in Ellis Griffiths' um, 
uh, chronicle. This isn't Keridwen's cauldron. This is the cauldron of the head of Anun. What is its disposition with its dark trim and pearls? What is its nature? What is its quality? And then we have this um, very poetic description. It has a dark trim and pearls, connecting it, of course, to the sea, to the ocean. In the next section, we hear what its disposition is. This is its nature. This is the, qu the quality of the cauldron. It does not boil a coward's food. It has not been destined to do so. Now, if we're thinking of this in terms of the Taliesin folktale, which is really one of the only uh, other source texts we have to go on when it comes to uh, the Taliesin mythology. Is this talking about the divine um, uh, drink of Awen, the divine potion of inspiration? Is that what's being referred to here? This is not a coward's food. We can see that Gwion Bach, after he tasted the food of the cauldron, certainly had to be courageous when he was hunted through his different animal forms by Keridwen. Or are we talking about a totally separate tradition? We're not sure. Either way, magical food is part of this cauldron, as is a magical food part of the cauldron we find in the later folktale. So a connection. But we do know that the cauldron that's been referred to here is actually identical to the cauldron that we find in Kiloch and Alwen. Uh, the magic cauldron that doesn't boil a coward's food, uh, that's in the possession of Diurnach Withel, Diurnach the Irishman. I'll just finish this section before we look at that episode from Kiloch and Alwen. It does not boil a coward's food, it has not been destined to do so. Theog's flashing sword was thrust into it, and it was left behind in Lemminog's hand. And in front of the door of Hell's Gate, lamps were burned. So now the other world is literally being described as Hell, probably because it is the site of horrific slaughter. This is where three full loads of, of Prudwen, of Arthur's ship, three full loads of men were slaughtered in this otherworldly place as Arthur attacked or tried to gain entry to the other world. Only seven returned, yeah? And in front of the door of Hell's Gate, lamps were burned. So this again is conflating Christian learning, Christian terms with native Welsh mythology. There's, it doesn't appear to be a conflict between the two, yeah? The poet here is mixing them easily. Uh, just to finish this section. And when we went with Arthur, famed in tribulation, save seven, none returned from the Mead Feast Fort. So now we have another name for this fortress, another name for the enchanted otherworldly place. It's been called Caer Sidi, it's been called Anovn, it's now the Mead Feast Fort, Fort. Uh, Caer Vedwid in the Welsh. Just to go back a little bit to lines two and three. Theog's flashing sword was thrust into this magical cauldron and it was left behind in Theminog's hand. This is very similar to this episode from Kiloch and Olwen. When Llen Theog Wyddel grabbed Caledvulch, which is the Welsh name for Excalibur, and swung it around and killed Diurnach Withel and all his retinue. Diurnach Withel being the owner of the magic cauldron in Kiloch and Alwen. The hosts of Ireland came to fight them, and when all the hosts had fled, Arthur and his men boarded the ship before their very eyes, and the cauldron with them full of Irish treasure. So there you can see a great degree of similarity now between the poem Pray the Anovn and this episode in Kiloch and Olwen. Not only do we have the great King Arthur crossing the sea to an island 
um, and there is a great battle and there is a cauldron in the mix. There is this similar character associated with uh, both the story and the poem also. Llen uh, Lleog Wyddel is what he's called here in Cilwch and Alwen, but he's just Lleog in the poem, in that second line. Lleog's flashing sword was thrust into it. Yeah. Llen Lleog Wyddel grabbed the sword Caledfulch and swung it around. So both the poet and the storytellers are clearly referring to a similar story, a similar body of law that was known to both of them. To move on to the next section, I hope you're keeping up. I'm splendid of fame, songs are heard in the four quarters of the fort, stout defence of the island. Now, of course, this is echoing the beginning of the earlier section, the four corners of the fort turning to face the four directions. Here, the suggestion is, is that this is actually the fortress in the story. I'm splendid of fame. Songs are heard in the four quarters of the fort. The enchanted fortress here. Caer Pedravan in the poem. Stout defence of the island. Now, it is ambiguous and it's not clear, but we can guess that King Arthur, alongside three full loads of his ship Pradwen and Taliesin, they crossed a sea, they attempted to gain entry to the otherworldly fortress, and that they succeeded in gaining entry, and that Taliesin sung a song in this place. Now, this is strange because in the very first section, it's Gwair who sings the song. It's Gwair who is performing in front of the spoils and the herds of Anovn. You remember in that very, very first section, he is the exalted prisoner. He is bound in a great chain and he is singing sadly. And that sad song, according to Taliesin, is the poetic prayer of the Welsh bardic tradition that will continue forever. Well, now in this section, Taliesin is also in Carcidi. Taliesin is also in the otherworldly fortress, and he is also singing songs there. There appears to be a conflation between Guion and Taliesin. It's very weird. It's very strange. We're not quite sure what's going on. Either both figures singing separately now in Kairasidi, or they are one and the same. Perhaps they are the same character. Perhaps they are different aspects or different parts of the same personality. We're not sure. But it's interesting to note that we have Gwair singing the great poetic prayer of the Welsh Bardic tradition in the very first section. And in this section now we have the great Taliesin singing Bardic songs also. Then another very strange uh, reference here in the third line. Fresh water and jet are mixed together. I'm not going to discuss that. It's very ambiguous. Other people have their own ideas about what that means. Sparkling wine is their drink set in front of their battalion. Now, this appears to refer to the defenders of the enchanted fortress. So whereas we know that there has been great slaughter because only seven have returned, well, these are the fighters that Arthur and his men have been battling in their attempt to gain entry. Sparkling wine is their drink. Maybe they're French. I don't know. Maybe they're drinking champagne. Who knows? But sparkling wine, an expensive, valuable drink, is set in front of their battalion. Of course, sacred drinks are something which are a feature of the Welsh Bardic tradition. We need only think of the Godardin, for example, and the mead that's presented to warriors before they go into battle. And then just a repetition of the narrative here in the last uh, couplet. Three full loads of Pradwen we went by sea, save seven. None came back from the petrification fort. Caer rigor in the Welsh. Rigor 
being borrowed from the Latin for um, as in rigor mortis, yeah? Now, this is a very interesting name for the Enchanted Fortress because it suggests that it's somehow connected with death. Petrification, petrified, yeah? Turn to stone, turn, turn solid, yeah? Rigor mortis has set in. It's interesting that this is another name for the Enchanted Fort. I don't rate the pathetic men involved with religious writing. Those who hadn't seen Arthur's feet beyond the glass fort. I'm sure you're realising that you really have to be in the know to fully understand this poem. Unfortunately, all those in the know died several centuries back, so you're going to have to make do with me, I'm afraid. As far as we can tell, this first line here, I don't rate the pathetic men involved with the religious writings, is something that we find quite often in the Book of Taliesin, that is Taliesin having a go at the clergy. Now, not necessarily having a go at the clergy for being Christians, because Taliesin here is very much a Christian also, even though he's evoking all of this non-Christian native Welsh mythology. He's very much a Christian in the book of Taliesin, but he doesn't rate the men involved with, with religious writings. Essentially, he doesn't rate the standards of education in the clergy. He doesn't have a problem with their connection to God, it's their connection to learning. Taliesin and the Welsh bards are the great masters of learning in the Taliesin mythology, and they are pitted against people in orders. They are pitted against the monks and the scribes. Those who hadn't seen Arthur's feet beyond the glass fort. So now we have another reference to the otherworldly fortress, with a different name. We've had Caer Vedwid, the, the Mead Feast Fortress. We've had Caer Sidi. We'll discuss what that means in a moment. We've had Anovn is another name for it. We've had Caer Rigor, uh, the Fort of Petrification. And now here we have uh, the Glass Fort. Now, as I mentioned, even though this is a 12th or 13th century poet, uh, poem, it draws on other traditions. We've seen it's already drawn on the figure of the exalted prisoner. It's already drawn on the idea of the Welsh bardic tradition and their bardic prayer, which will last forever until the day of doom. We've also seen how it's referring to this story type of the King of Britain crossing the sea to a magical island, big battle, cauldron in the mix, Taliesin involved, only seven return, that story. But here we have a reference to a very old story indeed, which appears to go all the way back to the 8th century, because the glass fort is actually mentioned in the Historia Britonum, an, an ancient Latin history uh, of the British people, of the Welsh essentially. In Historia Britonum, we have this very brief description of the people who settled in Ireland having this very strange and disastrous encounter with a glass fort out at sea. So Ireland is also apparently part of the story mix. We have Arthur crossing to Ireland uh, in Cilwch and Dalwen. We have Bendigaidran crossing to Ireland in the second branch, which is a again very similar to this type of story in pray the Anoven they're crossing to Anoven but it's referring to an episode in Historia Britonum where the island is island again yeah or very close to island again so here uh, the Historia is talking about the the different uh, tribes or peoples that settled island We've had reference to a, a few settlers. Uh, and then after these came three sons of a Spanish soldier with 30 ships, each of which contained 30 wives. And having remained there during the space of a year in Ireland, there appeared to them in the middle of the sea a tower of glass, the summit of which seemed covered with men to whom they often spoke but received no answer. At length, they determined to besiege the tower, 
and after a year's preparation advanced towards it, with the whole number of their ships and all the women. One ship only accepted, so only one ship has been left behind an island. The other 29 ships and the women have gone off to attack this glass fortress. One ship only accepted, which had been wrecked, uh, and in which were 30 men and as many women. But when all had disembarked on the shore, which surrounded the tower, the sea opened and swallowed them up, so they all drowned. Ireland, however, was peopled to the present period from the family remaining in the vessel which was wrecked. Very peculiar. This is essentially a part of the story that we find in Pray the Anoven from a poem 500 years later. Other parts of this poem could be just as old. It's very difficult for us to know. But as we read on through the section, we see that it's almost identical to what we find in the uh, Historia Britonum. 6,000 men were standing on its wall. It was hard to communicate with their watchmen. So this fortress has a special watchman. It's not identical, but we can see in Historia Britonum, the summit of the fortress was covered with men to whom they often spoke, but received no answer. Yeah? It's essentially what we're seeing here in the poem again. And then just to repeat, three full loads of Prydwen went, went with Arthur, save seven. None came back from the Fort of Impediment. So another name now for the Enchanted Fortress, the Fort of Impediment. Does impediment mean restricted or bound as Gwyer is bound? Does it mean restricted or uh, unable to move because you're dead? It's difficult to say. But it chimes with this theme of death once again. It chimes with this idea of Caerigor, the, the fort of petrification. Yeah. The next section, again, Taliesin complaining now about being bothered by idiots. I don't deserve to be stuck with pathetic men with their trailing shields. So lazy or tired warriors who don't know who's created on what day. When at midday was God born, perhaps he's referring here to the lack of learning that the clergy get. They don't know who's created on what day. When at midday was God born, when is Christmas essentially? Nor who made the one who didn't go to the meadows of Devui. We're not sure what that means. It's very ambiguous. Devui there could refer to the Dovey River uh, or perhaps to somewhere else. We're not sure. Those who know nothing of the brindled ox with his stout collar and seven score links in its chain. The brindled ox, of course, is referred to in Kilch and Alwen once again, uh, as it is in the triads, uh, triad number 45, I think. The brindled ox is one of the three prime oxen of the island of Britain. So Taliesin again referring to native Welsh learning, but mixing it with Christian learning. When was... God born. When did Christ arrive? When was Christ born? At Christmas, obviously. And then shifting straight away to native Welsh mythology with the brindle ox. Very interesting. This conflation once again. And when we went with Arthur, sad journey, save seven non-returned from Manthwy Fort, another name for the fortress, the enchanted fortress. We don't know what Manthwy means. It's very difficult to say. Mandwy Fort is also referred to in a poem concerning Gwynap Neath. So we have an otherworldly character connected with an otherworldly fortress in another poem. Just to finish off here, the last few sections. I don't deserve to be stuck with pathetic men with no go in them. Those who don't know on what day the Lord is created. So talking about Christmas again. Is this a poem that was performed on Christmas? We don't know. Nor when at noon the ruler was born. Nor what animal is it they guard with his silver head? Not sure what that means either. Some people believe it's referring to a special type of crozier, a special type of staff used by the clergy. We don't know. Or is it referring to a special type of animal, which is often associated with Anoven? Deer, pigs, special oxen, these herds, these special animals 
which are uh, residents of Anoven, sometimes given by the lords of Anoven to mortal men, such as with uh, Prideri's pigs. When we went with Arthur, sad conflict, save seven none came back from the angular fort, Caer Ochren. Now the angular fort there, it does suggest that we are talking about this four-cornered fortress, that Taliesin is talking about his song revolving around the fortress. He is turning to face each direction as he sings in Anoven, in Karsidi, in the Enchanted Fortress. That would make sense. Monks congregate like a pack of dogs because of the clash between masters who know. Now that's interesting because it might be referring to the context of the poem. Perhaps the medieval audience understand, or perhaps there is a prose section missing for us that was never recorded into the Book of Taliesin that relates the context of the poem that Taliesin is in contest with another master of learning and that the monks are congregated around like a pack of dogs because of this clash, perhaps between Taliesin and their great contender in the clergy, perhaps some very learned priest who's come to contend with Taliesin uh, in a contest of knowledge. That could be the case. That is also the type of context that we find in other poems from the Book of Taliesin. Who's to say? Again, it's not very clear. And then Taliesin goes on to discuss the type of knowledge that he's often discussing in other poems from the Book of Taliesin also. Whether the wind follows a single path, whether the sea is all one water, whether fire, an unstoppable force, is all one spark. So these are examples of cosmic learning, of course, an understanding of the elemental world. What is the nature of the elemental world? Is every droplet one body of water? Is every spark of fire one fire? These are questions regarding universals or perhaps um, ideals, uh, as in the platonic sense. Monks congregate like wolves because of the clash between masters who know. So referring to the, the potential context there again. They, the monks, don't know how the darkness and light divide, nor the wind's course, its onrush, what place it devastates, what land it strikes, how many saints are in the void and how many altars. I praise the Lord, the great ruler. May I not endure sadness. Christ will reward me. And that's the end of the poem. So here we can see Taliesin not only claiming to possess cosmic wisdom regarding the elements and the ideals and these universal principles and qualities in the natural world. He's also claiming to understand Christian learning better than the Christians themselves. How many saints are in the void, that fourth line there, and how many altars in the void, how peculiar, not in heaven, but in the void. How many saints and altars are in the nowhere, in the spiritual no man's land? Very strange uh, thing to say in a poem. Why doesn't he say heaven? If they're saints, surely they should be in heaven. Or perhaps in Taliesin's understanding, according to his knowledge, the other world, heaven, is a void-like place. It is beyond existence, so it is a nowhere. Yeah? Again, as, as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's actually very difficult to grasp any solid fact here. It's hard to pick apart what the legendary Taliesin is actually saying. Again, as we find with many of these texts uh, in medieval Wales, for example, in the Four Branches of the Mabinogi and several other poems from the Book of Taliesin, there is a mixture of pagan and Christian influences. There's not a distinction between the two. 
which says to me that the Welsh Bardic tradition at this time didn't distinguish between native learning and perhaps what we might call continental or classical learning through the church. It was one body of law, L-O-R-E, that they preserved and, uh, and that they used. And this one body of law was made up of a very Welsh perspective on Christianity uh, and a very Christian perspective on the Welsh Bardic tradition. There is certainly a very strong sense of a Welsh other world. This isn't the Christian heaven that's being evoked here in these other worlds, in this otherworldly fortress. There could be a very plural attitude being expressed here, that Christianity is certainly one way and one valid description of the universe and the cosmos and, the, and that there is a God and that there is a saviour and I will pray to Jesus Christ to save me. And it is important that we know when he's born, but there's all this other stuff also. There's the native Welsh law, um, which appears to be providing the main metaphysical foundations for the poem quite literally, in that it is the otherworldly fortress which is being referred to time and time again here. It is Anovn. And it is strange to have Anovn so closely associated with Christianity because, of course, in various uh, other Welsh sources, we find that Anovn is de uh, described as a hell. It's described as uh, the Christian hell, whereas... Plenty of sources from the four branches of the Mabinogi to this poem clearly show that Anovn was not considered a type of hell specifically, although it is metaphorically referred to as the gates of hell because great carnage took place there. Very strange mixture of influences. Just to finish off here, it's worth paying attention to all the different names for Anovn in the poem. This is how they appear in order. We have Caer Sivi. Sivi, of course, is borrowed from the Irish she or Seath in Old Irish. The she, of course, relating to the ancient Neolithic tumuli that the Tua de Danan were believed to retreat to. They're essentially the fairy mounds in Irish law. So Caer Sivi literally means the fairy mound fortress, which is interesting because these are passage graves. These are places also associated with the dead. Anovn, of course, is explicitly mentioned in the first section. And then we have Caer Vedwid, the Mead Feast Fortress, the place where the ceremonial drink is used. The Mead Feast. The Mead Feast is often associated with Welsh warriors and particularly in the Welsh Bardic tradition, with their death. In the Godolin poem, the mead is described as their poison because they drank the mead, probably uh, in a ceremony of oath-giving, before they went to fight on behalf of the, of the chieftain who gives them the mead. Yeah? The mead payment, the chieftain pays the warriors the mead before they go and fight for him. So it's like an oath very closely related to this idea of death. Then we have petrification fort, again related to death. The glass fort, very interesting. Invisible yet solid. Invisible yet impervious. A really interesting uh, metaphorical description for the other world there. Then the fort of impediment. Again, is this referring to some type of restriction through death? We're not sure. Caer Vanddwy, Manddwy Fort being referred to in the Gwynapnydd poem from the, um, the Black Book of Camarthen. Gwynapnydd, it's unclear if he is specifically associated with death, but he's certainly a version of the magical huntsman, one of the kings of Anovn. Yeah? So very closely associated with, with this very same fortress. Caer Ochren. The angular fort, or the fort with angles or with, with uh, clearly defined sides, achar being a, uh, essentially an edge or a side, yeah? 
we have in Revelations 2, 1, 16, this is the King James Version, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. This is, of course, referring to New Jerusalem. To a version, if you like, of heaven, to what will come after uh, the great turning of history. Yeah. Now, it's not explicit that that's what's being referred to with Kairochren here, but there are many allusions to the four-sided fortress, to the four corners. Song was heard in the four quarters of the fort, revolving to face the four directions. Now, either it's the song that's revolving, of course, or the fort, we're not sure. In front of the door of Hell's Gate, lamps were burned. Another very clear uh, Christian reference to the space, but this time it's described as Hell. Songs are heard in the four quarters of the fort, stout defence of the island. So there may be a hint at uh, New Jerusalem there. We're not sure. Uh, it's one of the things that Margaret Haycock uh, alludes to in her notes on the poem. But either way, just at the very end here, my own take is that this is referring to the land of the dead. This is referring to uh, the space where the dead have gone to. Arthur appears to be attacking the other world to gain entry, either to retrieve Gwair which would be mirroring what happens to Arthur's men in Kiloch and Dolwen, retrieving Mabon, another exalted prisoner. Or he is going to steal the Great Cauldron, as he does in Kiloch and Dolwen once again, but stealing the Great Cauldron perhaps for Taliesin, under Taliesin's guidance. Because Taliesin is there, and it appears to be a magical cauldron, either way... This could be why Arthur is attacking, or it could be uh, because he's after the great oxen or this other strange animal, or perhaps he's after all of these things. But in attacking the other world, which appears to be quite a foolish thing to do, all of his men die or all of his men save seven. There's great death and destruction. And this might be why this is called Kairikar, the fort of petrification and the fort of impediment, we're not sure. Or maybe, and this is my own theory, that this fortress is the place where dead warriors go. And that's where we're going to be going next week when we look at the poem uh, Parthar, Which Man is the Gatekeeper? I think that that poem uh, relates to this poem here, that they're both talking about a similar type of uh, encounter that, that, that King Arthur has with an otherworldly fortress.